Greetings, Earthlings, and welcome back to the Relationship School's Smart Couple Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Gaddis, and we are on episode number 199. Whoa, 199 episodes of straight-up relationship content? Doesn't that get boring? Not for me, folks. I could talk about this day and night. I don't know about you. So thanks for hanging in there if you've been with us from the beginning. Really cool to have you in our tribe in an ongoing learning kind of way. And if you haven't joined our Smart Couple Facebook group, please do, all right? Just uh, go to your Facebook search bar. You might have it open right now and just type in Monogamy Smart Couple Facebook group. That's, I think, the title. Answer a couple questions and we'll likely accept you. And it's uh, thousands of people in there having conversations about love, which to me is one of the most important conversations we can have each day in our lives, because it's the thread that connects the rest of our life is our human relationships. And if you're new, welcome to our podcast. Hopefully you're going to get some really good content here. And in this episode, I have got some amazing people. The This couple wrote one of the all-time best-selling relationship books out there, Getting the Love You Want, Harvel Hendricks and Helen Hunt. And check this out, they, as relationship experts, they were about to get a divorce. And it was, they had attorneys, they had the whole deal on the table. They'd been to lots of different therapists, five different ones, apparently, they said. And it wasn't working. So they doubled down and did the work that they were teaching and got through it. And this is a really powerful story. So I talk a little bit about their techniques, the Imago method, um, the Imago, what Imago means for for some of you who are like, what the hell is that? I've been hearing about that for years. Yeah, they share it. And we cover some really good terrain here. And it's just really sweet to have elders who have been in the trenches with couples and who have survived the ups and downs of their own long-term relationship teaching us about partnership. Um, I love learning from people like this. And I got to meet them in person at Dan Siegel's Interpersonal Neurobiology Conference, which was really fun. We were going to do the in-person interview, but they were so full, and I didn't want to bug them. So we didn't do it. And I want you to zero in in this episode on their story when we get to that, because there are some really important notes to take there about how they got through it. And it's somewhat basic in terms of Helen's um, account. Uh, It's really sweet. And then they just started applying th- some basic, basic practices here. Okay, this stuff doesn't have to be rocket science. Here at the Relationship School, we're trying to keep things street level for you. Um, even though sometimes we go into this crazy uh, neuroscience land because I geek out on that. But I try to translate that for you, right? If you notice that. So let's get right into it here. I'm going to just read a little short blip about them because their bios are extensive. Harville Hendricks, PhD, and Helen Hunt, PhD, are internationally respected couples therapists, educators, speakers, and New York Times bestselling authors. Together, they've written over 10 books with more than 4 million copies sold, including the timeless classic, Getting the Love You Want, a guide for couples. In addition, Harville's appeared on Oprah uh, 17 times. Yikes. And check this out, Helen has been in the Women's Hall of Fame for her leadership in the global women's movement. So these two are powerhouses and elders, and I think you're going to learn a lot from them. So let's dive in. Welcome to the show, Harville and Helen. Thank you. We're glad to be here, Jason. Yes. Yeah, it's a real treat. Uh, It was really awesome meeting you guys at the Interpersonal Neurobiology Conference. My wife and I Definitely geeked out on what you guys shared, and I loved the dance in particular that you did with the music. <laughs> yes, right. Super fun. That's, that's a lovely song. Yeah, yes. totally a great song. Will you guys just uh, introduce yourselves in a minute or less, um, just just for the listener? I'm, I'm sure most people know who you are because they might have read your book or seen it on the in the uh, bookstore, but just a quick snapshot of who are you in the world right now? Yeah, you go first? Well, I'll just say that I am the happiest woman on the planet because I get to be married to Harville. <laughs> and but I just think on my 30 seconds, I'll say that Jason has just referred to a song, and the words to the song were, were 
love is how we treat each other. Nothing more. Nothing mm -hmm. more. How we treat each other. And I just appreciate, Jason, you bringing that sentiment uh, to the beginning of the recording because it's that simple. Yeah. And uh, if anyone on the recording uh, that's listening would like to look at, listen to that song, they can find it on the internet. Great. We'll include that in the show notes. Well, I think the what I'd say about myself is I'm also the most fortunate man in the world to be married to such a beautiful woman, and to um, and to be so old and to have such a young young woman in um, in my life. Uh, also, that we are uh, co-creators of Imago Couples Therapy, and uh, and the uh, the book Getting a Love You Want: A Guide for Couples, which is being re-released this year. Yes. This it's one. going to be re-released this year. It is 30th anniversary, and we'll be coming back out. And we are uh, doing a big promotion to try to see if we can get it back on the uh, bestseller list. Yeah. So <clears throat> we're, kind of, we're kind of busy and kind of excited about uh, what might happen. Cool. So awesome. Yeah, I mean, getting the level you want. Who wouldn't want to pick this up? Like, who doesn't want that? I think this is a yeah. brilliant title, by the way. <laughs> oh, thank you. We had a big argument about that with the publisher 30 years ago. We wanted a title called Conscious Marriage. <clears throat> and so the, the, the publisher was so kind and they did a market analysis of that and said, well, that would probably sell 20 copies. And <laughs> Good, so move. Said, Good move. Good move. With another, another title. So I blurted this title out. Um, on the, It was on the telephone. Just blurted it out. So, well, I'll call it Getting a Love You Want Then. You know, they wanted something that would attract people, want sure. them to want to buy the book, and would offer make them a title with a promise. They said, "Yeah." I said, "Okay, tell them getting a love you want." They said, "Perfect." They went out and did more. I said, "No, no, 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 no. That's too, that's too light. That's too commercial." And they went out and did market analysis, and they came back and said, "Potential bestseller." Okay. So we said, "Okay, you can have the title." Yeah, I said that. <laughs> nice. Over the yeah, and it certainly is a bestseller. So thanks for the gift you guys have put out into the world in so many ways. So we're going to get into that, uh, all the frames and things you guys do, including Imago. Um, I want to start with one of the quotes you mentioned at the Interpersonal Neurobiology Conference. And you both, I think, one or two of you said it. Um, there were, you actually said it twice in a different way. So I wrote it down. I remember writing these notes. Connection is not something we do. It's who we are. And then yep. later, like 10 minutes later, you said, a relationship isn't what we have. It's what we are. Can you guys explain this for the listener? Um, let me see if I can give a uh, <clears throat> simple and light version of that. Um, so if you think about individuals relating to each other, then they have to work to connect. <clears throat> uh, and that's a particular way of looking at the world. We call it a paradigm of the individual who is independent and isolated and who has to construct relationships. But if you look at the world another way, which is the way we look at it through a different lens, which is rooted in quantum mechanics, um, the, the universe is an interconnecting whole so that we are all already connecting as a part of our nature. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that we have to do. It's what we already are is connecting. Yeah. That it's an adverb, it's a, or a gerund, it's a gerund, and it's not like an estate you can achieve, it's a reality that you can experience. So we are connecting. It's not that we try to connect, we cannot not connect, and so forth. You can lose awareness that you're connecting, but you can't lose connecting, because that's being, that's fundamental reality. And so therefore, you're not in a relationship, relating is what you are which is just kind of a second subcategory of the, what we would call the ontology of connection. I know that's a big, big, big concepts and big words, but fundamentally we are connecting. That's our nature. And therefore that means relating is our essence. Uh, and this is backed up by neuroscience. When Dr. Sigmund <clears throat> Freud founded the field of psychoanalysis around 1900, he would talk about um, the brain and as did his followers, and the brain is contained in the skull. And the brain is a fixed um, and isolated uh, part of the body and uh, relatively isolated up there in the skull. And in the 1990s, there were breakthroughs in neuroscience that 
actually the brain is impacted by our relationships and they say now we have social brains yeah. that our yeah. brains are experience dependent that our brains are impacted by our relationships uh, and are very impacted uh, due to neuroplasticity and totally new concept in the 1990s. So we are our relationships, like how we end up at the telos at the, you know, as we move through life, who we become, it's not just us living our life. We are embedded in a field of relationships that shape who we are. Yeah. And it seems like our, our past, um, and when we get injured, we, I guess you, you would say Harville that we lose awareness of the connection that already exists. Is that right? That we get yeah. hurt and all of a sudden we're, we're seeing something not clearly that we're already connected and we perceive a loss of connection. We shut down we contract our heart. Is that kind of. Yeah. Right. When, when you experience a negativity a negation or put down some judgment or criticism, uh, our brains register that as a potential threat. For sure. Uh -oh. Therefore, activates our defenses. And when you activate your defenses, you then uh, cut off your experience of being in a flow, of being uh, flowing with the universe, flowing with each other. You are now an isolated, independent self who is now behind the wall, and your primary uh, awareness is... Uh, how did I get hurt? Am I going to die? What do I have to do to live? And that's not connecting. That is protecting yourself. That's a survival mm -hmm. defense. And you can't move in back into connecting until you move back into a state of safety so you can prop those defenses. And then we think there's an energy flow. That's when Helen was talking about the brain. Dan Siegel is pretty convinced that the brain, the, the brain itself is simply the hardware of an energy field. And that, that energy field extends beyond the brain and extends out and to and is impacted and impacts people outside of itself. So the brain is not confined to the, to the meat inside your head. The brain is the energy field generated there that uh, extends outside. So, so if you take that, then all of us are, in fact, energy fields interacting with each other. But when something in, in a flow of, of back and forth. But if somebody threatens you, then you will move out of that field in and, and become self-contained and self-protective. Then you look like an autonomous, independent, self-sufficient individual, but actually you are frightened and dependent. You're a frightened individual who's protecting him or herself. Yeah, absolutely. And, but that's simply an illusion. You're not. You can't be independent because you are part of the whole. Yeah. And you just all lost awareness of your connection to the whole. And so most of us really suffer there, and most people live in that space of disconnection rather than in the space of the flow. Yeah, and other than reproduction, would you say part of the reason we partner is to heal that uh, perceived loss of connection? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I think that we, we begin, uh, you may remember that video we showed at the conference from, uh, by uh, Edtronic, oh, yeah. the still face, where the beginning of life, the baby is in the flow with the caretaker and the, and the caretaker inserts a negative message like the turn away and then the turn back with a stare. And the baby then goes into panic and into the fence and try the baby then loses the flow. Yeah. And, and, uh, and then the mother smiles again, turns back and smiles and changes that. <sighs> and then the defenses drop and the baby moves back into the flow. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's in some sense we said as a metaphor for life. Yeah. Uh, would, how did you guys, when, when you came up with uh, the term imago, certainly this, I'm guessing this wasn't a new concept. People uh, may be smart enough to know when they partner with someone, they start acting like the other person's parent. And there's this weird projection game going on. What had you, because so many people now love this term imago and it, it just makes sense to people. And I, I just really value that. I, I first heard it in grad school, um, like, 18 years ago or 16 years ago and someone was like imago therapy and imago this and I and then I got explained to me and I was like oh yeah okay I got it so will you just give um I mean how did you guys come to that term given that this was again probably already going on you guys decided to say hey let's give this a term um because it's happening like give us a little short backstory on that sure yeah very quick 
Um, so um, probably it was in the 79, it was in, in, uh, 79 and 1980, uh, we got clear about something, which was that there is a direct link between the partner you choose and the unmet needs you have in childhood with a particular caretaker. So we got to explore that. And just briefly, um, the theory was we put together as as uh, infants and, uh, from the from the very beginning, even now, the people who are doing prenatal stuff say it starts in the womb. Yeah. That the experience dependency of the brain is not just outside, but also inside. You, you, you create a, a synthetic image of all of the input from your caretakers. And this, your brain creates this because that helps the brain navigate and the infant navigate where to go for the resources that it needs in order to survive. But the primary thing is these caretakers have flaws and there are some needs they don't meet. And those needs they don't meet become really important to the infant because those needs are directly connected to survival. So the brain really remembers the missing piece more than it remembers the piece that was giving. So when you uh, grow up, uh, and, and if you don't get that mitigated in childhood, when you become an adult, uh, you, will, uh, you will look for a caretaker who will be similar to the, I mean, you'll look for a partner who will be similar to the caretakers, especially will have the flaw that the caretakers had because you have to get what you need from the person who didn't give it to you. Mm -hmm. It's so good if you get it from the person who can give it to you, who would. The brain has an unfinished agenda. So we call that the image of the caretakers is what guides you in the partner selection process. So we're trying to name the system. It was very early in the creation yeah. of the system, trying to name it. And we went through all kinds of names. We said, well, let's call it image therapy. Let's call it image, image, image. And nobody liked that. It didn't have any gusto to it. So I went home after a, a day of puzzling that and looked up the word image in the dictionary and the word um, the Latin word for image is imago. Uh, and I thought, well, I studied Latin in high school, and I certainly have a right to use one Latin word. Uh, so I went back to the group the next day and said, well, I wasn't going to propose we use the word imago. Well, about half the group liked it, half the group didn't like it. The people who liked it, like, yeah, it was imago, you know, had gusto to it. The others said, well, nobody would know what it means. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I remember saying, well, Someday it'll be a household word, then everybody will know what it means. So let's just throw it out there. Yeah. So we decided to, um, and at that time we had, the, we had the power to make the decisions ourselves. We got consultation, but still reserved the right to call our system what we wanted to. So that's how Imago came as the designate for the whole intellectual system. And then what happened uh, in the dialogue um, is uh, uh, when we were dating, <clears throat> <clears throat> um, I was getting a master's in counseling psych and, um, and I was working um, with uh, getting exposed to different kinds of psychotherapy. And I, I learned about a woman named Jackie Shift who did reparenting of schizophrenics and um, was really interested in, in, in the genre of transactional analysis and gestalt therapy. And she'd really said, you can, you know, they can regress in your arms and you can help heal them of their childhood issues. And primal therapy, Genov, um, uh, also lay on the floor and regress in the childhood. Yeah and uh, heal their childhood by, by being held by a therapist or a clinician and letting them re-experience and relive that. At the time, catharsis was a part of the mental health field uh, in a way that it's not as much, but it, the repairing of the past became a part then of you're, you're drawn that Imago influences mate selection, the partner you choose, and you have the potential to heal each other. Yeah, w totally. What do you guys say to the new age, pe people that criticize this as new age this sort of nonsense that like, I don't attract my parents. Like, what are you talking about? There's no science that says that. And like, how do you, do you guys get that criticism? Occasionally I hear people with that criticism. I'm curious how you handle it. Well, it's in very infrequent. 
um, now because there is a science that that validates that many people have done research projects um, in which they have uh, actually set this up and, and did you know uh, tra trade analysis of the caretakers trade analysis of the partners found the correlation to be surprisingly and shockingly for them accurate so uh, we we very seldom get challenged on it mm -hmm. um, and, and I think partly because uh, it's become a kind of mainstream accepted idea for, for uh, and, and also because now we can say, well, we made it up when we were starting because we didn't have actually any empirical research. We had clinical research, which is a little bit different from a controlled study. But uh, graduate students uh, over, over the past 30 years, a number of graduate students have done very, 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 it hadn't been, you know, published largely, but they've done very, very, Beautiful research projects in which they have validated uh, the whole thesis of the, okay. the uh, that the caretakers impact uh, and it's also a basic thing that the past impacts the present. Yeah. It takes a very cynical mind to say no, I am not a part of my environment, uh, you know, current or mm -hmm. past, because you know if you think just a little bit about it, you are and you know you are. It's just when you get down to these details that make it feel a little bit funny, you can come inject it. But I, I don't deal with it very much at all. So um, one of the things I treasure in being married to Harville is he takes something that's very, very murky and he crystallizes it very simply. And sometimes I do that, but mainly you. And uh, when we work with uh, couples these days at times and we're in a rush or, or, or we are or we intentionally condense uh, a wonderful um, therapy or workshop to just a couple hours, we say everyone growing up felt one of two feelings. When you were raised, you were either intruded on, like your parents told you what you should do, they told you how to act, they, they told you who you wanted, what school you should go to, and like they kept shaping you and you didn't get to be yourself or your parents weren't there. Like yeah. they just weren't, they hardly, they never asked you how you were feeling or, and, and, and most people had both, but one was particularly painful. Can you identify, were you primarily intruded on or were you neglected? And we give people a chance to circle one of those two words and then go, now, did you bring that feeling to your relationship? Does that ever show up in yeah. your relationship? So right. there are like easy connection. ways that we times yeah. do that. Plus, um, um, oh, I had something else I was going to say. Well, let me ask you a question about that, Helen. When, what about people that say, I had a great childhood and I was fine. Okay. Everything, so I, that was, I was perfect. Point. I was just going to say, okay. <laughs> I was going to say, and some people insist that, oh, their partner, oh, gosh, what a screwed up family that they had, but um, their partner had, but theirs was happy. They yeah, were happy. mine was perfect. Yeah. When we work with couples like that, the important thing is to accept that person's narrative. Mm -hmm. and, and you can know, and you don't have to make a big point out of this, there may be things that that partner, that person experienced in childhood that they're just, they're, un, they're, they don't give themselves permission to identify in mm -hmm. that way. But what we ask them to do is if they have a repeated frustration with their partner of either being intruded upon all the time or neglected, then we uh, just invite them to stay with that feeling and yeah. think of anything in their past. Was there anything? Maybe it's school or da-da. But anyway, that, that being done, and maybe say to them, the reason we have a couple does, does do this is that it depathologizes the partner. Mm -hmm. Like if, if your partner um, is, you know, just needs their freedom, they, 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 you know, don't fence them in, you know, they need their space and yeah. they tell them what to do all the time. Well, if they need that, um, it's important to respect <laughs> it no matter where it came from. Cool. But, but it depathologizes it if that person said, my mother was just always no. making me what to do. Then it's the pathology is off the partner and onto their parent. Mm -hmm. yep. and, then they yep. and that's right. When, 
when you um, when you do what Helen said, you say, okay, uh, what's the frustration with your partner that happens three times and is emotionally charged negatively? Uh, and does that come up ever? And what do you do? And so forth. Um, they always have it. They're in the they're in the workshop because their marriage isn't working. Yeah. First of all, so if you had a perfect childhood, you're supposed to have a marriage that works. Um, and so, and we make that really clear. If you're in this workshop, you had problems in childhood, not enough to put you in a mental hospital or prison, but enough to put you into life life's misery. Enough mm-hmm. that you would pay all this money and fly all this way to come to this remote retreat center, spend two days with us. I mean, <laughs> you don't do that if you're happy. Right. <laughs> You're playing golf or doing something else. Yeah. So by the, in, by the end of a two-day workshop, usually about 14 to 16 hours, uh, the, usually the, about a half a dozen, they usually they used to be all men, but now we find more and more women will also have the I had a perfect childhood thing, but I can't stand my partner. Mm-hmm. Uh, and by the end of the workshop, they, there are so many processes they go through that ultimately that defense breaks down. Yeah. And they see, oh, my God. I did have this screen memory. Uh, I remember one guy said, you know, I didn't have any problems in, in, in childhood. I had this, um, you know, I was appreciated. Uh, everybody in our family knew what to do. Uh, nobody, and I said, well, and they, how, how do they react to that? They said, well, nobody ever expected an appreciation. You're just supposed to take out the garbage or you're supposed to take the cows or whatever. And, but, you know, we didn't do all that sort of stuff. And I said, well, what is your biggest dream? <laughs> and he said, without thinking, that somebody would appreciate what I'm doing. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> right. So, you didn't get it in childhood. But what's the biggest complaint about your partner? She never sees what I do. Yeah. And so for a while, click O, yeah, it looked innocuous. And it's not dramatic. You know, yeah. it's not dramatic. You don't get appreciations. But it's necessary uh, to the psyche to be seen and be visible and be appreciated because that means to the brain, if I am, I'm not going to die and my um, genes are going to survive and I'll pass them on to other generations. Very important yeah. you have patients from other people for all kinds of reasons. And fundamentally is that your, your, your uh, genetic material would be passed on. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Nice. Hey, here's a quick interruption. Smart couplers from the relationship school. Hey, guess what? We're holding a contest in the next episode because it's our 200th episode. And thank you so much for staying with us. So one of the requirements to play in the contest is you got to be a member of the Smart Couple Facebook group. So go into your Facebook search bar and just type in Smart Couple Podcast or Smart Couple Monogamy and you'll find it, ask to join, and that way you can qualify. That's your first requirement to enter the podcast contest next week where we're giving away coaching with me, a course, a discount on the Embracing Conflict weekend in the fall, and some other fun stuff, all right? So we'll see you there. Back to Harvel and Helen. Um, I want to come back to you, you, your relationship with each other. Uh, At the conference that I went to where you guys spoke, you were talking very vulnerably and openly uh, just candidly about, you know, uh, it seemed like to me what I heard was there was a time in your marriage where divorce was on the table and then you guys turned it around. And I just think it would be valuable for the listener if you'd be willing to share what wasn't working and just like one or two things that you did that had it turn around. Cause a lot of people don't make it at that moment. They, they, they're at divorce, it's on the table. And then that happens. Um, Well, we both believed in the theory, and for some reason, um, we, it was just a chaos in our life that um, it's not that it didn't work, we just really didn't apply it in a systematic way. Like you didn't apply the tools. Right. Yeah. 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 We were the cobbler's son who had no shoes. Uh-huh. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, um, and I think we just blamed each other a lot, you know, for, I mean, there was just a lot of blame and whatever. And um, um, two, two things happened. For me, it was more reading um, one day. So, so we did. I dragged Harvard, the therapist, in New York 
five different therapists. And the last one told us we were the couple from hell and that just gave up. Wow. They, we kept hiring the other therapists, but the last one fired us. And so, so then we announced, Therapy gave up on us. <laughs> so then we did it. We did go to the divorce lawyers, do the papers, told our family and told the Imago community. And then one day, um, um, I read a book on science that talked about the left hand, brain hemisphere um, is, you know things, but you know things by separating from them. It's called separate knowing, mm -hmm. where you do the thing to know, to know it well, like architects need to separate from things to make sure it's all in order. Mm -hmm. And there's connected knowing and connected is right brain knowing and you swing into the thing for a while and swing out again, but it's an intuitive knowing of things. And seeing that, I suddenly saw Harville and me with Harville distancing a little bit from, um, he, he, he was busy writing the theory, but doing so to make it so precise, he distanced. Yeah. And then I fused into every problem and I just, it's all I wanted to talk about for the problems we were having. And, um, but couldn't talk in a very logical, succinct way that would, be um, that would invite his listening well mm -hmm. and problem solving. So I just suddenly realized that we needed to integrate our two brain hemispheres and also learn, learn a lot more about the brain, which we did. And then one day we just really stumbled upon the fact that for people to connect, they need safety. And I think you brought that more into that, that word into our lives mm -hmm. that you have to be safe in a relationship to connect. And when there's negativity, a look in the eye, a tone of voice, safety, the, the relationship is ruptured. It's oh, not safe. Yep. I feel anxious. And Harville suggesting that we practice that and me getting a calendar and go, okay, let's do this every night. You know, what did we do that during the day that we might have done in a more safe way? And we, we regulated ourselves every night for weeks and months and finally we had enough positive like there was enough safety and so we called off the divorce <laughs> yeah, wow. yeah but it was, it was that decision uh, i think uh what the, the thing that got you was what we would call now differentiation that i'm not you you're not me i go out in the world with my cognitive brain she goes out the world with her emotional brain so therefore we don't see the same world Mm -hmm. And so that was the basis of the negativity. And the hope that I could become more oh. logical and that you could become more empathic. I right. went, wow, yeah. all we need to do is learn yeah. to... Well, that emerged as, as a solution, but at, as, as, as a problem, we were polarized with the two ways of accessing the world. Yeah. And her obviously is chaotic. Mine obviously is rigid and cold and detached. And so I'm not behaving and she's not behaving either, but she's emotional about it and I'm logical about it. So we, as Helen said, we got to this awareness that the interactions we were engaged in was um, really destructive because it was constantly a put down. Uh, and um, because she's really emotional, I am really cognitive. So it wasn't like I'm a little yeah. cognitive, but yeah. some emotion. So you guys like, are really polarized. We were really polarized. Our complementarity was severe. Everybody is in a complementary relationship. Ours was really severe. Mm -hmm. And since we're both uh, articulate and intense, uh, you know, it was really bad. So when we decided to remove negativity, cold turkey. Yeah, you went zero, the, what you call zero negative. Zero negativity. And we went cold turkey and got this calendar that I was talking about, started checking it off. Had three months of black marks before we had a good mark, um, we were, but, but we began to see that what we would now look back and say with the new terminologies that have come out in, in relational psychology in the past decade, we, we were regulating our own affect uh -huh. with the calendar and with the uh, not uh, negating each other. But we also found we had to add something to the relationship mm -hmm. and putting stuff in was appreciations, caring behaviors, 
deliberately setting up fun things to do. Now we look back at that and all the research about the pleasure centers of the brain and how you can activate them and you can train yourself to do joy. We were doing all that sort of like in the wilderness with no tools yeah. and found our way to a, a place where one day the war was over. And then it became a very creative, uh, interactive flow uh, for the past, I would say, 18 years now. That's um, amazing. It is a, it's That's a amazing. miracle. It's a miracle. And, and, and I love that like no one could help you, sort of. And so you decided to help yourselves and like yeah. get your shit well, together. Well, and... we, we wrote the book. Yeah, <laughs> like you had to, you had to like live it. We had the book right there. We just hadn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but And for anyone who's hearing this for the first time, the mention of zero negativity, they go, I'm sorry, that's not for me, but uh, I got to be authentic. And yes, you do. It, you, you can learn to say anything that you feel or think, but in a way that lands less negatively on your partner. Mm -hmm. If you're negative with your partner, they're not going to listen. So we, we have in our process how to raise things with your partner, you know, and stop shame, blame, or Chris criticism and learn to ask for what you want in a respectful, kind way. That's like for starters. But um, also uh, the goal really isn't zero negativity. It's when there's a negative transaction, there's a bit of an ouch that one or, or both of you experience. You have a quick repair. You quickly identify a problem and say, could we have a redo about that? Could, could we redo that transaction and let me model how if the transaction went a different way, I would feel fine. The way it just happened, I've got some problems, but would you be willing to say that in this way and help each other <coughs> learn how to be in each other's presence where we're more safe for each other? And, and I think that the, the thing about this is we began to become each other's teacher. So if Helen felt to put down then she could train me about how what I said was a put down for her and what she would need instead. So that then I'm informed about who she is. This is the differentiation process. I'm um, informed about, and we use, we, we finally began to use what we call now the, the curiosity mode that instead of going to judgment, it's like becoming interested in, in that uh, response to that transaction. So going to curiosity, dropping the judgment, giving each other information, taking it in. So you become partners in the project of the co-creation of your relationship. Totally. And it, I mean, we do need to educate our partners, right, about our reactivity and where it comes from. And it amaz it's amazing that a lot of people don't do that. It seems so simple to me. Otherwise, you just bang into each other and you never know what's going on in your partner. Yeah. Now, you guys do, do a time frame in your book. You talk about like, uh, make a commitment um, for a period of, like if you're in a hard spot, right? So for the listener, if they're in a hard spot right now, one of y your frames would be, which I think is great because we had a therapist actually do this with my wife and I before we were married because we were having a really <laughs> rough go at it, which was, hey, pick a time, uh, let's call it six months and do not make threats, do not talk about leaving the relationship and go all in and actually start practicing. Will you guys say a little bit more about why that matters and why that's so important if you're on the brink of like a divorce, say? Yeah, well, we, we uh, start imago therapy usually with a commitment to 12 sessions. And, and unfortunately, we got known a little bit as a 12 session therapy. And what we find, I say to the book, no, that's the on ramp. It could last for three years, but you have to make a commitment for the specified period of time that you will not, not, you will not miss a therapy session. You will also, uh, engage in these um, corrective behaviors mm -hmm. and be able to integrate skills. Because what happens is that your brain has um, a, a homeostatic set about, and it's figured this out, if I can just keep these conditions right, like I don't speak up too much, I become compliant a little bit, or I criticize a little, or whatever, there's a kind of balance that the brain has and when you start interrupting that with behaviors that are very positive, it, be, it ruptures the homeostasis of the brain. Mm -hmm. So every time you get better, the brain says, oh, this is worse because I, don't, I know that I'm not dying here, but I could die if I went there. Yeah. So the brain goes through this homeostatic crisis. And if you're not committed 
to go through three of those, you will not make it into therapy. Mm. So you have to go through three of them. After the third one, the brain then reaches a homeostatic state. And if you, but that's why the commitment to a specified period of time. And we found over many years that 12 weeks will take you through three crises. And, you know, and I, so I, as a therapist would know that somebody's going to call me uh, about 10 days into therapy or 12 days into therapy and say, we don't think we're coming back. Yeah. And I was made a commitment to 12 sessions. And I told you that you need to do that because you would call me because you're, that means you're working mm-hmm. and the brain not getting anxious. Yep. Uh, so uh, this is what's going to, you know, don't come back if you don't want to, but if you don't come back, you're going to be worse. Okay. Th- this uh-huh. is super helpful because people need, basically you're saying, uh, it's like a personal trainer, right? I, I don't go and because it gets hard that first week I quit. It's like, uh-huh. let's stick it out for 12 weeks and see what happens. Exactly. And, and if you do that, then you'll arrive at another place. And then what happens is you go up again and go through a crisis at a higher level. And I have to try you wonder, when are these crises going to be over? Well, it'll be over when you stabilize safety, predictable safety and reliability in the relationship, or that you know that if we do blow it, we'll, be, we'll, be fi- we'll fix it in five minutes. Mm-hmm. So the brain does not have to go into the, um, the anxiety of a negation. Yeah. Uh, and what we're, where we are now is that we can hardly tolerate a disconnect. Um, and so it's like, I'm going to go in there and fix this right now because it, this feels so awful. Totally. My brain has lived in this joy. And when there's a negation, it's like, I'm going to die. I've got to get in there. Yeah, I don't and, want uh, this. And, that, and we would fix that. Uh, and I used to take three or four weeks to do that. Uh, <laughs> You're a guy. Activity. Up. And yeah. then it takes you know, a long time to get out of it. So you never want to habituate in a negative place. Yeah, I'm well, so with you on that. Get rid, negative, get rid of it and get back to the flow. And you can learn to do that. And then after a while, your brain will say, fix this, fix this, fix this. Yeah. Uh, and you will. There are two things you get at the end. You get a healthier relationship, but you also get a more integrated brain. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you learn to problem solve um, and uh, you problem solve basically when you shift from judgment to curiosity and wonder about your partner um, instead of judging and assessing them all the time, like wonder why they're acting that way and learn more about why it is they're doing what they're doing and why it is they feel the way they feel before you judge them. Mm-hmm. Um uh, you move to the upper part of your brain and you release neurochemicals of well-being, uh, dopamine, norepinephrine, acetylcholine, and you just go yeah. around feeling better if totally. you have that real integration. Yeah. yeah, I love that. That's great, guys. As we start to get close to winding down here, I, I have uh, just a couple of logical, practical questions. How long have you guys been married now? We've been uh, married 37 years. We've known each other... 42 years. Wow. That's awesome. And you have kids, nearly right? Half, nearly half a century. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And we didn't Amazing. get along very well until like this last yeah, Eight, 18, 18 years. years. Yeah. yeah. And kids, how many kids do you guys have? We have six between us and six grandkids. Wow. So Super we're leaving cool. behind. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I want to transition into your safe conversations uh, as we end. Um, I really was inspired by your videos that you shared. I mean, it's unbelievable uh, what can happen, right, when you teach people how to have a safe conversation, really. And, and essentially, if I have it right, it's like l- listening to someone, you know? It's just like learning how to finally listen um, and do I have it right and clarifying and is this a good time to talk and all that. Um, will you just say a little bit, just whatever you want here in a couple minutes about safe conversations and, and the impact it's having on the planet. Yeah. So, so this is Harville's idea that uh, the science did become so simple and lasered compared to what it used to be like. People have referred to us as quote, the Steve jobs of relation robots, the Steve jobs of relationship. And that's really yeah. horrible. Because all the credit, like we took something oh, murky, no. murky, murky, and you just simplified it. So, Um, So safe conversations is not the therapy part of relationship uh, building. 
they've taken out we've taken out the regression part, but it's just education. Like the, like what you used to talk about, this should be taught in school. Yeah. You could talk you could teach this stuff in school. Absolutely. So, took a city in Dallas and we're teaching people to do it. And um, people can be trained in this. They've People come from all over the country mm-hmm. and the world to be trained. And we just had our first training in New York where people just learn to teach other people how to talk. They learn to do it themselves and learn to teach others how to take turns talking and listening. And we're going to have one in L.A., yeah, and these are the significance of that is we're not leading those. Yeah. We have now leaders who are now leading the training programs, the doing doing the workshops. And it fundamentally is what you said. We discovered in the clinic uh, many years ago that the quality of the conversation between couples is what changes them, not the content they talk about. Yeah. And once my mind got separated that they can talk about anything, but if they don't talk about it a certain way, they don't get anywhere. But if they talk about it a certain way, then the problem tends to go away anyway. Uh, or if it's a problem that can't go away, at least they can then solve it because they have become partners in that project but rather than opponents. So that was so clear what changed people in therapy that it dawned on us that you could take that out of the clinic and, and teach it anywhere. Yeah, and that uh, schools needed it, uh, corporations needed it, congregations needed it, governments need it. So we just decided, well, why don't we just see if we can change the world and insert safe conversations <laughs> into the-, the psyche of the whole country? So we only have nine billion people to go yet, <laughs> uh, but we do have about. You guys have made a s- serious dent, though. You know, just, I mean, most people, it's like, oh, I'll start with this little church over here. You guys are like, let's take on a city. That's bold. <laughs> Well, we figure if you if you have a take on a big project and fail, you will get more done than if you took on a small project and succeeded. Nice, that's good advice. I've never heard him say that before. That's very interesting. Is that interesting? <laughs> um, <laughs> one, one uh, just a quick question. I always ask therapists because you guys are therapists. You've been in the field in the trenches for many, many years. Um, one piece of you know therapy can can get a bad rap, and it can also save people's lives. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. What do you think, um, what is one thing that therapy is doing well currently in 2018? And what, what is like a piece of critical or constructive feedback you have for therapists and therapy as a field? So, can I start? Sure. Okay, well, first, uh, we invite the field to treat more couples or, or people in their context because we are not isolated beings, we're social beings. So, but... Um, But I am excited that therapy is now teaching clients about their brains. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, because learning about the brain and your ability to manage what part of the brain you come from is very empowering. And what we've learned is that idea of catharsis getting your feelings out uh, really uh, reinforces the parts of the brain that make you feel horrible and mm-hmm. keep you away from problem solving. Yeah. So that in the seventies and eighties, they said, get your feelings out, just scream them like da, 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 da. Yeah. And uh, there was something called woundology that people just kept talking about their wounds and you, it's really good to briefly identify your wound and then go about the process of how you build a different relationship, knowing about that wound, mm-hmm. um, what do you do about it instead of feeling it again and again. That only reinforces all those neural pathways. Yeah, and what I would add to that, just as a, a, a bridge and crossing on that bridge, is the, it's a kind of, I don't know if we'd call it a critique, but it's our... Um, our, our paradigm, our commitment is that therapy uh, with Freud got uh, located inside and the, th- the experience and wounding and healing got located in subjectivity. And so uh, with Freud, the world went inside human beings. And, and it made sense that it would do it because there had been no subjectivity in all preceding history. Mm-hmm. Uh, Human beings were simply subjects of the king, 
or um, God or, um, or the lords of the manor. And there wasn't much interest in interiority, uh, except for poets who, and people who wrote songs, but they still didn't explore the inner world. So Freud was the door and, in fact, created the whole construct of an inner world and then, you know, populated it with structures like id ego and super ego. Sure. And people have been working with the, in, the inside for a long time. But what finally got to us in working with couples is that, it's just what I said earlier, that the exploration of their interior worlds was a very slow and hardly changing process. Mm -hmm. When we began to change how they interacted with each other in the space between them, the behaviors they engaged in and the quality of those behaviors, they began to create new uh, neurons and new memories in the brain so that they change faster by changing the outside than if we explored the inside. Yeah. So what our, what our view about therapy is therapy needs to move to the outside where, where, where experience is created. You don't create, you don't create your world inside your brain. Create, your brain creates a world by taking what's outside and putting it inside its memory and then structuring it. So if it all comes from the outside, we say, why not go to the outside, change that so the brain takes in a different world. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of spending all of our time looking at memories and looking at dreams and looking at feelings and looking at thoughts, now you can change all that. Go change your behavior. And create a safe environment within which that occurs. And then something amazing happens in the brain. Yeah. And what we say what happens is you begin to experience this sense of safety with others. And then you feel, begin to feel joyfully alive. And then you realize, hey, this is how life is supposed to feel. This is not like right. something to acquire. This is something to recover. Mm -hmm. So we found that you get that if you move outside. So we're going to guide... Uh, in our, I don't know if the right word is guide, but we're going to propose every time we get a chance that the therapy field start moving outside to include context rather than just stay inside the self. Cool. Um, and a and last point. Uh, mm -hmm. You said that so well, horrible, because I didn't do that justice about dealing with couples. But um, also, um, couples need to realize and therapists need to realize that if a couple has a problem, the answer to the couple's problem does not reside in the therapist. Yeah, the, the therapist's hands, exactly. The couple's problem resides in the couple. And the couple needs to learn how to speak to each other uh, and tell each other what the issue is, but mm -hmm. mainly learn to ask for what they want. And a therapist becomes the facilitator of that couple's exchange mm -hmm. of information. And mm -hmm. it's a new way uh, that therapy is being done that um, really, um, Omago was one of the originators of that concept. Yeah. Uh, the people know what they need on the inside. And, um, and we give them opportunity to explore that language that and and connect to each other so that they can have the healing at home. They don't need the therapist after, office after, once they get it. They yeah, beautiful. It. Yeah, and you guys have said like the healthy family, really healthy communities, healthy world starts with a couple, and I, I love that. I Last question here, I'm as some of you, you may know, I can't remember if you know, but I started the relationship school as a way to help get this kind of education you're talking about into high school kids and oh, eventually <clears throat> and college kids. So. That. Yeah, right. our, our mission is to reach a, a million teens and Ooh. we're going to do it and we need, you know, we need a lot of help. But I always ask my guest, uh, guests in this case, if I had a room of a thousand young people and I could only teach them one thing about relationship and love uh, and you were whispering in my ear and you only had one thing, what would you have me tell them? Well, I'd help how, how to talk so that they don't... Um polarize and, and connect beyond their differences. We think that that the engagement with language at the micro moments is what changes everything. So I would teach them how to talk. I would encourage you to introduce safe conversations into your system. So so we we, we don't want to be a, a program on in, we don't want to be a program in anybody's curriculum. We want to ride on your horse 
Mm-hmm. You know, if we ride on your horse, your horse will run better because the people will know how to talk. They'll know how to regulate affect. They'll know how to engage. They'll know how to connect and they'll transcend difference. And when you do that, you don't have much else to do. Cool. What I would suggest is what Harville does. What Harville does with the room is he has them turn to the person next to them and give each other an appreciation. Mm-hmm. And they, they pause, they take three deep breaths, they look at each other in the eye. And even if they're strangers, one of them gives the other an appreciation about a color that they're wearing or a look in their eye or something about history if they know each other. And the receiver of that message mirrors it back. Mm. And then he asks the person who received the appreciation to send an appreciation and the sender receives it. And there is a transformation in the energy of that room. Yeah. Like that fast, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. And and you don't have to talk as much about it as to begin to invite the people to experience what it feels like to that kind of energy. Then the room has a loving energy to it. I'm going to play with that. Thank you. It's awesome. Well, guys, it's been a real treat. You beautiful couple here and just so much wisdom and and knowledge and working so hard to help the masses and the population. So thank you. And where is a good spot, uh, the best spot to find you? Obviously, uh, I encourage people to get this book and I hear you're, you know, coming out with the new edition. So where should people locate you guys? Harbolandhelen.com is uh, our personal website and relationships first org is our social activist website and the therapy website is imago is imago relationships.org so okay. we have three websites Great. one well, for there one for so imago relationships.org for therapy uh relationships first for the social movement and harville and helen for anything you want to know about us sweet okay awesome we'll include those in the show notes guys thanks so much it's been a real treat thank you we appreciate you having us on. It's joy to meet you. Yeah, likewise. And look forward to seeing you down the path. Okay, me too. Connection is not something we do, it's who we are. Don't you love that? Uh, that feels so true to me. So what'd you think? Uh, what's the takeaway? And remember, your action step is to go check out their work, of course. Getting the Love You Want, that's a pretty easy read. Uh, It's a good one, I think, for couples. They have some exercises in there. Uh, It's been around a long time, but they keep updating it. And they're coming out with a new edition really soon. So if you want to hold out, you might want to do that. But uh, I'm sure it's uh, like, I mean, it's going to be better, but this book's really good for an awesome relationship book. One of the classics. And another action step, all right? Uh, Here's one. Go zero negative. Just make a commitment, the two of you, if you're in a relationship, And if you're single, do it with yourself in your own mind. Zero negative means I'm just not going to blame anyone else for my problems for one month, and I'm going to see what happens. If you're in a relationship, then just have that open conversation. Hey, let's go zero negative. Let's not blame each other and not be negative and not bring a ton of negativity into this thing for 30 days, and let's see if we can do it. Deal? Shake hands, hug, high five, fist bump, um, hold each other, right? Um, do more than that if you want to seal the deal, (laughs) but try it out. All right. I think it's a very, very useful practice. And of course we here at the relationship school want you to come play with us sometime. We are enrolling now for the fall class of the relationship school. That's the deep psychology of intimate relationships. Uh, You'll need to apply currently. We are going to do a free summer web series in late June. So stay tuned for that. If you're on our email list, you'll hear about that. If you're not, you probably won't hear about it. So make sure you're on our email list. And you can do that. Just go to relationshipschool.net and right there on the front page. Or you can go to .net forward slash relationship test to just rank yourself on how you feel like you've done relationships so far. It's a great, fun way to score yourself and assess how you do this thing called intimacy and love. Awesome. And then of course, join our Smart Couple Facebook group. We could see you in there. It'd be fun to have you. That's right on Facebook. Just go in the search bar, Smart Couple, and you'll see us, all right? Outstanding. 
Thanks for being with us. And again, thanks to Helen and Harville for being such uh, trailblazers and for helping the world have safe conversations.